This is session 17, it's Tuesday, January 24. And we have four outstanding presenters uh, for our um, e-poster session. The first um, presenter is AJ Rasmussen, who is a uh, doctoral student uh, at Indiana University in Bloomington. He's in the group of Phil Richard in physics. Um, for all the presenters, I have a few things that I um, uh, ask them. I'm just gonna say a few words about him and then I'm gonna let him talk. Uh, so he graduated from Brigham Young University with a BS in physics in 2018. He's currently a PhD candidate in Indiana University working with Phil Richard on quantum simulation with trapped ions. For the last two years, he has also interned with IBM's Qiskit research team under Olivia Lanes, where he develops the Open Science Prize and other educational content for graduate level researchers. We have more information from AJ, but I think we should let him uh, start. His presentation is entitled um, Quantum Simulation on Noisy Superconducting Quantum Computers. So share the screen and um, take it away, uh, AJ. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you for the introduction. And uh, today's presentation is uh, on work I did with uh, at IBM on simula quantum simulation. And before I get started, I wanted to also highlight that uh, in this paper, uh, we also put all of our code and every sort of plot that we've made on uh, our Qiskit Research GitHub repo. So if you or you know someone that's interested in kind of like a graduate level introduction to quantum simulation and they want to get more serious into kind of stepping stone into the literature, then definitely check out our repo. And uh, we're really hoping people can build off of it. And uh, uh, especially people who are potentially new to the field of quantum simulation. Um, so with that, we'll dive into it. Uh, so quantum simulation, this talk will be fairly general at first, then I'll get more specific. But in general, with quantum simulation, we, we have some sort of quantum system of interest. And here we have this beautifully rendered uh, com chemical compound. And we want to somehow emulate that with a quantum system we have a lot of control over, which, for example, would be a quantum computer. And how we do that is uh, there's a lot of different ways to do that. For example, we need to know some sort of properties of the material and encode that in the quantum computer and then execute some sort of simulation on the, the dynamics or find some observable you're interested in. And that then would inform. Uh, us on what's going on in the material, uh, much like classical simulation, but with kind of a quantum uh, speed up is the idea. And the, of course, the, you know, the details are where things get tricky. And so I'm going to go to explain just a brief overview of what it might look like to go from start to finish in a quantum simulation. And then I'll dive more into a specific example to highlight those print different principles. So First, we need to identify a system, like I mentioned earlier, and decide what is it we actually want to measure about this system. And once we have that, we then, we then need to uh, translate that into the language that a quantum computer can speak, which for quantum computers, that's in terms of bits, like these block spheres I have represent here to represent qubits. Sorry, I said bits, but I meant qubits. And uh, also poly operators, and uh, uh, such as like XYZ as I've written here. Once our system is encoded in this way, we can then actually execute some a sort of algorithm on our quantum computer. And so that brings us to the simulation part. And within simulation, there's kind of three main components. One is state preparation, which uh, can vary from very trivial to quite uh, complicated. And there's, that's a whole other field uh, and uh, study. Then there's the time actual evolution. Here I've listed trotterized time evolution. That's a specific uh, technique, but there are other ways to try to time evolve states. And then at the end, we want to measure our observable. And uh, here I've written direct measurement to mean just measure in the Z basis and use that data. But uh, sometimes ob observables, we might want some sort of correlation or a different basis. And uh, in our paper, we mentioned those, those uh, uh, other methods. And so if you're interested in that, definitely check that out. But for now, in this talk, I'll just be I'll just talk about measuring the Z basis. Um, you might think this is the end of the story, but obviously there's a blank spot in the bottom right slide, a part of the slide. And that's because 
when you run this, if you run, if you did this and ran your the quantum circuit, it would not, the data would not look very good. And that's where error mitigation comes in. Um, we can, once we've set up how we're going to actually execute, we need to go back and pick some sort of strategy to mitigate noise and modify our circuit in some way to uh, get the dynamics we want out, but avoid the noise. Um, so the rest of my talk here, I'm going to choose a specific example, a toy model that will help uh, let the quantum computing techniques kind of shine through uh, of these different steps. And I'm going to kind of go fast through these first two sections and then slow down for the time evolution and error mitigation portion of the talk. So the example model that we picked was a tight binding model. And we just want to look at the state dynamics of some particle in this tight binding model. If you're not familiar with the tight binding model, that's OK. Uh, it's relatively straightforward. It's decomposed. It's in terms of individual sites, which here we're considering five sites. And they're coupled with a strength tau. Uh, we've also included the defect, just to mix things up, uh, which has a different coupling strength. Uh, you could abstract this to, a or you could uh, think of this as an example of maybe an atoms in a lattice. For example, this would be position, and then each site is a lattice or an atom with some potential, and then you have some electronic wave function, and then that's tunneling through this lattice, and you want to understand the movement of that electron. That's just an example of how you might uh, the specific uh, model you might be thinking of. Now we need to know what the Hamiltonian is for the system, and uh, it's written in terms of second quantization operators here. Uh, so I'll first go through this first sum here. What we have is this is called a hopping term because our C operators here, they will operate on a site, for example, here, site I plus one, and it will remove the electron, so to speak. And then the C dagger will then create the electron in a neighboring site. And so that's why it's a hopping term because we move from one site to the other or vice versa. And the second term over here is simply, uh, we had to pull it out of the sum because we included this tau d to be different from tau. And uh, this tau d could be some something that orders models a disorder or something like that. Uh, and again, we've picked this to be some sort of, uh, as a fundamental model, because for, although this model is relatively simple, we could quickly add on terms that turn it into a Hubbard model or uh, play with the couplings to make it more random to be some sort of many body localized, localized model. But we wanted this to be like an introductory and a stepping stone for people to get into those more technical uh, simulations. So how do we then do this Hamiltonian encoding into our qubits and poly operator space? All right, so we have our system of Hamiltonian, but we want it in terms of right these qubits and these poly operators. So what would this Hamiltonian look like? And there's many transformations you can actually do. And a very popular one is the jordan Wigner transformation. I'm going to brush over the details here, but uh, feel free to ask questions if you have some later. Uh, what we can do is identify a poly operator string here, where this, there's an implied tensor product. And we wanted this string to preserve the commutation relations between C and C dagger. And these, I, these uh, uh, relations do that. And when we apply that transformation, we find that uh, our Hamiltonian can be encoded as an XY Heising model, uh, or Ising model, sorry. And again, I kind of circled that as just an answer. We're going to skim past that so we can get to the next portion. So now that we have this Hamiltonian, we can do the actual quantum simulation part and figure out our error mitigation strategy. All right. In terms of quantum simulation, we need an evolution op evolution operator. Uh, since the Hamiltonian is time independent, we can just say, all right, e to the i h t, and we have our unitary time op uh, evolution operator. Now, this thing though, is, this object is a multi-qubit gate as it stands right now. It's operating on all five qubits, and there's terms in here that don't commute, which kind of make it. Uh, complicated to work with. So how do we decompose this into two qubit gates and single qubit gates that a quantum computer might have available for you? And one technique to do this is trotterization. And I'm going to say trotterize. That's a more informal word for the uh, 
uh, for a Suzuki Trotter decomposition. And how the Suzuki Trotter decomposition works is we can say, well, let's just evolve for a little bit of time. And in that approximative limit of a finite, of a small amount of time, we can actu actually, uh, we're going to ignore some of the uh, commutation rules that would normally apply, right? So here I've highlighted our four, four different uh, operators in this term. And right now they're in a, this sum, but we're going to ignore kind of the commutation rules and split them into a product. And that's the approximation that we could do that. And what makes the approxima approximation valid is, as I mentioned, we're going to only evolve for a little bit of time, a t over m, where m is an integer, and that's called the number of trotter steps. So as we increase m, this approximation is more and more accurate. So in terms of circuits, this might look something, oh, sorry, and yes, all these four boxes have now turned into a product, and these are all two-body interactions which we could decompose into C knots and such. So the circuit might look something like this, right? You want this unitary, but what you have to do is approximate it as these kind of little steps in time. And to show now to show kind of how this is an approximation, here I've done some just simple calculation where we have an exact evolution in black, and then as we and then we plot the trotter evolution for different numbers of trotter steps, five and eight. And you can see as we go from five to eight steps, the red line more closely follows the black line. And this is kind of the general trend for trotterization and the idea behind there. All right, so this is how we're going to apply the, uh, this, is the this is how we're gonna apply dynamics to our quantum simulation. And when you do this, you plug, you'll plug it into a quantum computer. And let's say you have some state that's one, zero, 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 zero which would be uh, just one particle starting in the far left of that site. And we're going to see how it traverses the lattice. Um, and this is how you, this would be this classical exact sim values you expect. But when you plug it in your quantum computer, you find out that uh, you get this instead, <laughs> which can be a bit frustrating if you're new to the field <laughs> and uh, you want to try to understand what's going on. And so, this is because there's just noise on these devices. And if, uh, and I would argue that although your results might start like this, if you apply you know, physically motivated error mitigation strategies, you can get dynamics that much close, uh, match the real dynamics much closely. And that's what I'll show at the end here. I am getting short on time, so I might skip a few parts here. I'm just gonna highlight one error mitigation strategy, which I think is maybe the most important. And, uh, that is, uh, let me back up just one second here. So in terms of error mitigation, it's good to think in terms of hardware, like what's the specific hardware I'm, I'm using? Am I using superconducting qubits, trapped ions, photons, um, like NV centers, what, what, what's the actual hardware? And then what is the problem I'm trying to simulate on there? Okay, so I'm gonna highlight just one error mitigation technique and then uh, move on. So this is what I like to call the true native gate set. A lot of times, um, we talk in terms of C knots and single qubit rotations. But when you actually talk to a hardware physicist who's working with these superconducting qubits, they think in terms of driving fields and uh, uh, evolving poly operators. They think of rotations uh, like a ZX operation. Um, and so when if you can cast your circuit in terms of what's actually happening on the hardware, you'll get a, a very large improvement in fidelity right away. And so to highlight this, so I'm going to put a little X. Don't use CNOS. <laughs> use what the experimentalists use on the actual hardware. So to highlight this here with, uh, in just one minute, for example, when we want to apply this, this uh, trotter step, we are going to need to apply this XX gate. And we might think, okay, well, here's how we would decompose it in terms of C knots and just a standard gate set. But then you ask your experimentalist friend and you say, well, what are these C knots? How are you actually driving these on the superconducting circuits? And they would tell you, oh, well, we're driving this ZX interaction for pi over two time and wrap it with some single qubit gates so it looks like a C naught. And then you say, wait a second, that RZX looks a lot like this RXX. Why don't I just do, why don't I just drive my RZX gate for a little bit and wrap it with some single qubit gates to make it an XX interaction? And sure enough, if you do strategies like this, 
your fidelity boosts dramatically because for one, in this top circuit, you're driving twice and for a total of pi time. And in this bottom circuit, if you wanna trotterize and just evolve for a little bit, so theta would be small, you're driving your, this two qubit interaction very for a short amount of time, which means you have less error. And so you have fewer gates, shorter drive time. And uh, I'm gonna, I'm running out of time. So I'm just gonna close here with these last, these last two plots where here we've kind of had, a, we have an estimate for the circuit fidelity for various numbers of trotter steps. So as we increase these trotter steps, we have more gates. And you can see if you kind of naively just set up your circuit, your fidelity drops dramatically, but if, in terms of CNOT gates. But if you force the quantum computer to operate in these native gates, your fidelity stays higher, rel uh, stays relatively high. And you also uh, save time, or as you can see here, the RZX optimized circuits here in red uh, run for a short amount of time. So if coherent, worried about coherence and drifting, uh, your circuit will run faster and have less noise in general. So I'm going to skip ahead these other strategies I talked about and just say that uh, I want to share this plot here on the right, where if you combine error mitigation techniques with and modern devices, you can actually get dynamics that faithfully represent what you're looking for. It's represented by this these red data we got off uh, IBM device. So uh, with that, I want to thank you for your time and uh, leave it open for questions. Well, thank you for your presentation. So now this is where um, anybody who would like to ask some questions would, would ask some questions. Let, let's see if anybody has any questions. I've got one, Adrian. This is Terrell, France. Uh, thanks, AJ. Um, you're kind of out of my league here. I'm a, I do social simulations. And anyway, uh, wouldn't a transpiler, I mean, in, in most classical programming I do, uh, certainly not circuit building, the, the compiler does a lot of that homework for me. So uh, will the transpilers uh, be making these adjustments for me or, you know, down the road? Yes, uh, great question. So at this point, your regular old transpiler, particularly in Qiskit, it will not do this RZX optimization out of the box. That being said, though, you can, and in our notebook, we show you how to tell the transpiler, you kind of have to help it a little bit. You have to say, hey, these, it's hard for it sometimes to identify that uh, a circuit that looks like this, sometimes it's hard for it to know that this is act should be shown as what I've shown here at the bottom right. And so there are functions you can pass to the transpiler specifically and to have it do these specific kind of optimizations. But at this point uh, in the story of quantum computing, you have to tell it specifically and it's not kind of a out of the box option. And uh, that's one reason why we wanted to write this paper in this notebook as well as to show that uh, these options are available if you, you know, look for them. Yeah, thanks. I'd imagine as time goes on, these sort of things will be built in and per perfected. And me as a circuit designer, I won't have to deal with it. I would, I, I would hope time. so. I would hope yeah. so. But I think the one hard part, though, the one hard part is that you know, most algorithms are written in terms of CNOT gates. Yeah, yeah And exactly. you need kind of these pairings of CNOTs to get this real advantage here. So, mm -hmm. um, but this is something that I personally would like to work on in the future. And I think is a really promising uh, avenue. Yeah, and thanks, Terrell. Great, thank you. Okay, well, um... Um, I would like to point out that we ask, uh, before we get started in general, we ask uh, five questions of every presenter. So AJ was the first presenter, thank you. I was told that you are an excellent teacher and this is absolutely clear. So thank you, this was okay. wonderful. Um, and, and so this was really a great presentation. Now we ask five questions of every presenter and for the sake of the recording, I'm going to mention roughly what they are. Uh, there are two questions where we say, number three, where we say, can you enumerate your top three dream employers? 
companies that you'd very much like to work for or intern with, or any other plans that you have for the future? And the last question is, do you have any questions, literally any questions, any kind of questions that you might wanna ask of any of our industrial partners? Now, today seems to be an unusual situation, uh, but in general, there are industry members here. So for the sake of the, of the, um, of the recording, since we are trying to, we, we actually do have an office hours uh, program and it's fairly big. And normally Christopher Bishop who runs it shows up here, but he's not here, who knows why. Um, and uh, for the sake of, um, we, we, we also have not planned to, to, to join somehow quantum marketplace with, uh, with the e-poster sessions. Um, this is what AJ's response was. Uh, but, but unfortunately, I don't think there will be any industry member right now that could give us any feedback. So Teril uh, is the chair, the current chair of the TAC. Uh, Jake, who's the vice chair, was supposed to be here, but somehow he couldn't make it. Celia, who is the executive director, couldn't make it either and so on. Um, it doesn't matter. But he says, after graduate school, I plan to accelerate quantum hardware capacities in industry, particularly gate and qubit performance. I would be happy to do this in a trapped ion company in the United States, such as Quantinum or IonQ. I've also loved my time with IBM and would be happy to work there again. Okay, so the reason we ask is not necessarily, uh, in the past, this really was a significant question because people who would come here from small companies would get an idea whether their companies are known, anybody mentions them or not, right? Because the, everybody knows the big companies. But this was an opportunity for smaller companies, let's say Vests and Photonics or Montana Instruments. So whatever small company you can think of, for them to realize that people who are ready to uh, work in industry may or may not think of them. Uh, and, and so we got an answer from AJ and I'm gonna move uh, shortly to the second presenter. Last question where I said, do you have any questions? He says, and, and then there's nobody here to answer the question, but I promise to pass this question to the industry members and see uh, what we're gonna do with that, about the answer. How might the emerging uh, quantum industry fare in the current upcoming economic turmoil? So, so this is a very serious uh, and significant question. And normally there would be at least Charles Robinson from IBM Quantum that would immediately take a stab at this question. But as far as I can tell right now, we don't have any industry members unless, unless. Um... Well, yeah, venture capital is drying up quickly. Um, unless no, 505 is an industry member, but that's a phone number, but I don't know who that person is. It, this is Jake. Jake, oh, Jake how are you? So yeah, Jake yeah. is here. Okay. Um, okay, now let's move to the second presenter, if that's okay with you. I'm gonna share the screen and show you the screen again. and. Um, after a brief introduction, we're just going to listen to the, the presentation. So um, here's now the screen. Um, and I'm going to say that our second uh, presenter is uh, Carolyn Ten Holter uh, from the University of Oxford's Responsible Technology Institute. The Institute looks at ways in which technology can be deployed that recognize the need to consider societal impacts. Carolyn's background is in industry with legal and business development experience. She's currently investigating responsible quantum computing and AI as used in autonomous vehicles. The title of her presentation is Bridging the Quantum Divides, A Chance to Repair Classical Mistakes. So Carolyn, go, go right ahead. Thank you for coming here today. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, hopefully you can all see my screen now. Um, my my talk is radically different from AJ's because uh, I'm coming at quantum computing from a social science perspective. Although I work in a quantum in a, a computer science department, um, we look at the ways in which quantum computing has a, the bigger picture. So we talk to industry, we talk to policy. Um, we're very concerned with to investigate the ways in which quantum computing might impact on varieties of communities across societies. So the title Bridging the Quantum Divides is actually taken from a paper that I'm going to talk about in a little in a minute. But I thought I would start um, just by um, introducing the, the team here at Oxford. Um, we all work on responsible quantum 
Um, we've just started a new project, which is what the, the hyperlink is for, um, looking at responsible communication around quantum computing. You know, we're all very aware of the problems of hype. Um, there are kind of views and thoughts out kind of in the, in the wider world about what quantum computing means. Um, people are relatively familiar now with Shaw's algorithm, the idea that it, it, quantum computing might break existing cybersecurity and so on, even though, you know, any, everybody in the cybersecurity industry knows that a cryptographically useful quantum computer is still a long way away. But so these ideas are out there. And one of the concerns we have is that there's going to be a societal pushback against quantum computing because people will have these very negative associations with it. That's one of the things that we think might be a challenge. And kind of the, the, the guiding principle is this quote from a, a former research participant, for people that are on the brink of building a world changing technology, you should think seriously about what you're doing. And that's really the kind of the guiding principle of responsible innovation. So the Responsible Technology Institute is underpinned by principles of responsible innovation. So that is looking at questions of impact, um, talking to wider communities of stakeholders, and tr really trying to engage in a dialogue with society about let's collaboratively decide together what kind of future we want to build together and let's then figure out how we get there rather than focusing on where we think the technology could go and just going there without really considering what the impacts of that might be so the reason i wanted to talk about the the bridging the quantum divides paper is because it, it kind of illustrates some of these points quite nicely so so this is the paper um, no, the, the citation is there for anyone who wants to look it up. And um, our starting point was the speed with which um, quantum computing has accelerated over the last few years. We all know that you know, this is a hard problem, right? Even though it's, it's all largely engineering now, it's still really hard. But with the number of countries now, having quantum programs. Um, a colleague actually put a list on LinkedIn and it's, it's everywhere now. Australia, Canada, many, many European countries, India, Israel, Japan, Russia, South Korea, and obviously, you know, China and the US and so, and so on. Um, everybody's doing this. Um, and so there are colossal sums of money going into it, even though it's, it's, we know, you know, venture capital has been you know, it is starting to, to look a, bit, a little bit less uh, plentiful than it was. Um, governments have been putting enormous sums of money in because there is this recognition that quantum computing has this huge value to the economy and to society. And that is largely calculated in terms of dollars and pounds and yen and so on, rather than um, kind of societal benefit of other kinds. So in order for society to get these benefits of quantum computing, citizens want to know that it's being done right. They want governance. And at the moment, there is, there is none. There is no regulation that governs the quantum computing space. Um, other quantum technologies it's, that, are, that are, you know, a little bit more towards the, the industrial development end are, you know, they, they have their own kind of governance structures, quantum computing, who knows, but in order for societies to trust this technology, we need to have governance structures of some kind in place. And I stress that I'm not necessarily talking about legislation or regulation. There are lots of different kinds of governance. You can have things like industry standards um where government government is investing in the technology they have governance structures in place for those investments so there there is oversight you know we all know that when we've had research grants 
um, you have a, an enormous amount of paperwork to fill in and reports to write and so on, which is all part of those governance structures. So this is, this is what we're talking about when we, when we think about the, the way in which this is done. So needing to um, kind of reassure people that these, uh, these developments are being undertaken in the right way, uh, in a responsible way, um, we talk about responsible innovation. And this is very much about working with, as I was saying earlier, wide communities of people. So stakeholders, we're not just talking about end users, we're not just talking about the public. And you know, I do see some frustrations from quantum computing developers thinking that we are so far from end use that you know, talking to publics, talking to citizens is, there's so much you'd have to explain that it doesn't really make any sense to be engaging at this point, but we're not necessarily talking about end use cases. We're talking about stakeholders and that can be, that can be other industry partners, that can be policymakers, that can be other scientists in the same sort of, sort of field. Here at Oxford, um, we're pulling together the Oxford Quantum Institute, which is people from physics, people from computer science, people from materials, people from robotics, to try and have these kind of cross disciplinary conversations to talk about not just how the, the technical challenges work, but how we can collaboratively develop this. And so when you have those conversations with people, when you when you move up, particularly outside your own research field, and this is why, you know, coming at it from a social science perspective is, is so interesting for me, you think about some of these concerns in a wider way. And because the technology is still so early in its development phases, there is still time and space to respond to concerns. Yeah, this, this is still something that can be guided. If you compare it with perhaps something like AI, to a large degree, that is, that's out there, that's gone. And some of the problems that we've been seeing, some of the, the reputational damage that has been done to big companies where they have perhaps unwisely lent too much on AI systems. You know, let's, let's not have that happen with quantum computing. Let's not be getting to 2030 and looking back and thinking, wow, I wish, wish we had done that differently. So let's have these conversations. Let's respond to these concerns as we go. Let's think about societal impact. Let's think about people's need to trust the technology because that's a very present concern for people. So in the paper, we were very focused on this question of access to quantum computing. And when you're engaging with society, you, you start looking at who has access, who doesn't, and even with present systems, um, I think just, just smartphone usage in the US, more than 80% of the population has a smartphone. In Pakistan, that is less than 20%. So fewer than one in five people have a smartphone. And when you think about the impact that would have on people's access to opportunity, people's access to education, people's ability to kind of participate in international activity, even national, at a national level, there's a huge impact there on the economy of a country and people's life chances all of these different things that that just simple access to computing power can offer and what we kind of see starting to happen with quantum computing is it's a very expensive technology to develop it's being it's kind of aggregated in state owned research facilities in big companies this is not something that is currently accessible to many and as much as anything else we see nation states developing their own kind of quantum strategies that have a very nationalistic feel people want to grow their own and keep their own they want to keep their own researchers they want to keep their own research um, in here in the uk 
we have something called the National Security and Investment Act, which is all about who you can accept money from in your quantum startup or your spin out. And there are countries where if you accept investment from them, the government is going to look at that investment and may potentially repudiate it and say, no, you, you have to give that money back because they don't want that nation having a stake in what's regarded as a, a, a British quantum computing company. And this goes against the grain of, of where quantum computing has kind of grown up, you know, it's been a very a relatively small community. It's been very collaborative across national borders. And as I was saying earlier, when we all know, it's still really hard. There are still really hard problems to solve. And so people need to collaborate. So these kind of nationalistic approaches where you're not, nobody's thinking about well, how about we share some of this with the global south? How about we improve another country's kind of economic chances? Because, you know, then a rising tide lifts all boats. Um, this could be good for everybody. So we looked at, uh, you know, some of these issues and we came up with a few recommendations. This was a very, uh, very brief kind of thought piece paper, um, but we looked at some of the some of the initiatives that are underway at the moment for for trying to improve access to, to quantum computing so ibm has a system for example where, where it um, is trying to um, increase education around quantum issues um, amazon obviously has break it uh, a lot of these things are kind of online but they're not enough you know individual um philanthropic initiatives or companies trying to essentially they're trying to train up the next generation of their future employees by allowing them access to their quantum systems um which is one way to go about the capacity shortages certainly um but it's not enough um we think there needs to be international agreement and collaboration on these things because you know these are not going to be uh, computers that you have on your desk. There are only ever going to be probably a handful of them. They're difficult to build. They're going to be difficult to maintain. Countries are going to have them. Big companies are going to have them. Let's let's figure out ways in which we can make this uh, a benefit for everybody. And we see the the need for public and private sector cooperation, partly because of the, the governance question that I was talking about but also because research that goes on in private companies tends to be held within those companies and public, whereas publicly funded research tends, tends to be public. You know, that, that's not an absolute rule, but that tends to be the kind of direction of travel. And we also, we want to keep collaborating. We want to be able to, to talk to our friends in Europe and in Canada and in Australia uh, and in the US and, and be able to solve some of these challenges together without kind of worrying about whether it came from the US or whether it came from Germany or Finland or Japan. So we work with the World Economic Forum um, and they have developed some governance principles and you know, we, we see that there are every country that has a developed quantum computing program also has people working on these kind of collaborative responsible innovation approaches so you know, we see it as we see that as a very positive development and um, i'm very well aware <laughs> that this this kind of these kind of topics are wildly different from the sorts of things you normally discuss at these forums but i'm very grateful to have had the opportunity to to come along today and, uh, and talk about it. And I'm, I'm aware that I'm running out of time, so uh, I will leave it there. Any comments and questions? Thank you so much, Carolyn. Any questions or comments from anybody? Yeah. I've got one. This is Terrell. Thanks, Car Thanks, Carolyn, for the uh, presentation. Um, this is a constructive question. I just don't quite know how to say it exactly. Um, so, so quantum is a pretty small technology uh, in any way you look at it, quite frankly, nearly any way you look at it. Um, and 
it's it's really the social issues are just as present in much more um, omnipresent technologies like AI. Uh, and so in, in workforce training, for example, in quantum, the difficulty is not training people in quantum. The, the real macro problem is training people in STEM, particularly in the United States, maybe definitely not nearly as much in Europe, but in the United States, where the problem is a huge problem and quantum is just a small thing. So we've got AI, we've got, you know, every every person on the planet needs a phone now and quantum affecting our social lives, at least in our lifetimes, is going to be pretty small. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't study it. How do you see, like, let's say, you guys, you folks at Oxford and the community uh, figure the secret sauce of how to have socially acceptable quantum computing out there in the world. We're, it's just a small piece of a larger puzzle. How do you see anything we learn in this quantum work you're doing helping to inform or improve the bigger problem of you know technology and its effect on society? as a whole, how do you see going from the micro to the macro? Well, one thing about doing this work in quantum is that you're doing it in real time. I mean, I have just finished my, my doctoral thesis and while I was writing it, you know, things were moving so fast. Quantum development has, quantum has, quantum has developed in, in so many ways in just the last three years. So it's been amazing to look at how society how industry how policy responds to a novel technology and how policy is made for a novel technology and seeing some of the mistakes that have been made with with other novel technologies and as i was saying we have this opportunity to get out kind of in front of the train with quantum but the approaches that we you can use for quantum that we can develop in an agile kind of sand governance sandpit way um we can use those for other technologies as well. In fact, the, um, the UK government has developed a, a, an office for AI, looking at responsible and trustworthy AI. And some of that is based on this responsible innovation work that we have been doing in quantum computing. They have finally realized that AI needs some kind of centralized governance. And as I say, you know, not necessarily legislation and regulation, but some kind of governance structure. And so although quantum is a small case, potentially, it can inf the, the work we do in quantum, because it's all moving so fast, can really inform um, work on other novel technologies. You know, we talk to people uh, developing 6G systems and telecoms. And again, these kinds of structures this kind of responsiveness this engagement with people trying to talk to societal stakeholders those kind of modalities really help with other technologies too so you know quantum might be a small use case but it can be really helpful and kind of when you look across the board yeah it's a good point we're trying to get ahead of the get ahead of the storm here thank you um so, for example, uh, all right, uh, first of all, thank you so much. And uh, indeed, the presentation type of presentation was a little bit different from the others, but uh, we decided that we are going to have one presentation of this kind every time. Um, and um, the question uh, for Carolyn was, uh, can you enumerate top three dream employers? And so on, she mentions continuum because she says Ilya Khan has a very good handle on topics of this kind. But she also says that in terms of where I see myself being able to have the most impact, probably in policy work. So I, I regret uh, the fact that Corey Stambaugh is not here. He is the senior policy advisor and industrial liaison for the National Quantum Coordination Office at the White House, uh, White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. And he has been a very active member of this uh, attack in the past. Uh, I want to mention two things. So the title of your presentation in the paper was Bridging the Quantum Divide. And there is divide, let's say, between two companies that 
would like to work, but they can't on account together because they are in different political spheres of influence. Uh, and we've had situations of this kind. We have to be careful how to uh, approach a company, let's say in China, if we are coming from the US. Uh, th that's one type of policy. But there is a second aspect that I was thinking originally that has affected us in this particular uh, uh, context uh, with e-posters. And that's, uh, there is a divide because we cannot offer opportunity to everybody. So there's been significant work last week, last uh, year, and the year before to make sure that, say, big companies like IBM reach out to historical Black uh, colleges and universities and provide them with enough information and materials so that they can have the same opportunity as other universities and students that have, let's say, more money. There was a significant and concerted effort to reach out to historical um, uh, Spanish-serving institutions. And I think they've been somewhat successful, but not as successful as they would like to be. And I remember last year there was an announcement that there was a company that could build a 25 qubit quantum computer for you in 30 days. And it wasn't even that expensive. But what was expensive was the fact that they were using superconducting qubits. So you had to have a very expensive refrigerator, which almost nobody could uh, afford. And we are working on establishing what exactly recommendation we could provide for say computer science uh, departments if they wanted to have a lab, a hardware lab for quantum. And it's basically completely out of reach of any computer science department to try to build a three to five quantum um, computer at this time. Our undergraduates can probably just calibrate uh, computers. And if they wanted to build something, they probably could just build qubits. If they chose superconducting, there is a good aspect to all of this because you could work with a system such as Kiskit Metal. And the reason we're talking about quantum computing right now is because IBM first put stuff on the cloud and you can almost build um, the hardware and then hope that you can ship it to a foundry. And if there is enough money, then they could build it for you. And so the argument has been made, why do you even want to build it? And the answer is, I don't necessarily want to build it if I'm in school. I want to learn how to build it if I work for them later. But if I want to do outreach, I'd like to build my own materials so I can then take them with me to a high school and show them how to do it. So there's a divide in terms of opportunities that we offer to uh, communities. And also there's a divide in terms of how much money and resources you need. MIT has far more opportunity um, and ability than even, let's say, a, a university as mine. Uh, that was just um, um, a set of comments that um, I, I really value your presentation very much. And thank you for being here today. Thank and you. if anybody has any other questions for Caroline? If not, we're going to go on the third presentation. And this would be uh, Manuel, who um, Humberto Munoz Arias. Uh, he did his bachelor's in physics in Colombia and then moved to New Mexico where he did his master's and PhD at the Center for Quantum Information and Control at the University of New Mexico. I would like to share the screen now so I can show you one more time the, the title of the presentation. I lost it, I guess, but maybe this is for the um, uh, quantum processor that I mentioned before that it can be built in 30 days. Here's the um, list of presentations. So the title of uh, um, he, he, Manuel works uh, worked uh, with Ivan Deutsch and Pablo Poggi at the University of New Mexico. He works in quantum measurement and feedback control and applications in quantum information science. He's currently a, a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute uh, Quantique in uh, Sherbrooke in Canada, working with um, Alexander Blake. So the title is Phase Space Geometry and Optimal State Preparation in Quantum Metrology, which essentially is. Um, um, results uh, regarding quantum sensing. Uh, with this, thank you once again, Manuel, for being here. I'll stop sharing. Would you please start your presentation? All right, um, hope you can hear all well. Yeah, so yes, thank you. Thank you for the introduction and, and the invitation. Um, 
yeah, as as mentioned, I'm currently at the Institut Quantique, and the work I will be presenting today uh, was done while I was at the University of New Mexico and Sequic, together with Pablo Poggi and Ivan Deutsch. And uh, if at the end you would like to to know a little bit more details, I, I encourage you to look at a preprint we put we posted in the archive uh, recently. So I will be telling you how you can exploit uh, face-based geometry tools to to characterize some state preparation uh, protocols in quantum metrology. Um, and so the initial question here is going to be um, why state preparation? And the answer is is rather simple. It's because uh, non-classical quantum states are resources for quantum metrology. And by this, I mean that having a non-classical state allows you to have sensitivity of some apparatus that is better than what you will uh, have otherwise. And now a paradigmatic example of this is advanced LIGO. And the ingredient that allowed LIGO to become advanced LIGO is the injection of a squeeze vacuum into the interferometer. So phrasing it in terms in the terms I've been, I'm talking here, it means that this non-classical state of light, which is squeeze, is a squeeze state, allows you to have a sensitivity of this interferometer that is improved, that has improved over what it would be otherwise possible. And for me as a theorist, the interesting question here to, to ask and to explore is how can I find then strategies that allowed for a rapid preparation of these non-classical states? And suppose you have found one of these strategies, then can we understand what is the mechanism behind this, uh, this preparation speed? And can we generalize it and then maybe use it in other contexts? And I'm gonna be talking about particularly state preparation, but when we think about quantum metrology, right? State preparation is only a stage within a whole scheme. So let me start by telling you how a usual uh, quantum metrology scheme uh, goes. So again, sorry, you start with your initial state that undergoes some time evolution up to some finite preparation time. And then you get your non-classical state after which you get a secondary evolution that is that we are gonna call the sensing evolution, which imprints the value of this unknown parameter mu into some observable property of your system. And then you make a measurement of this property and learn something about this unknown parameter. And what I'm going to say for the rest of the talk is I'm gonna set conditions on the, set, on the last two stages of this protocol that I'm going to allow me to focus only on the first part. And in particular, I'm gonna be focusing on the situation where the physical system of interest is a collection of a spin uh, with one half particles, like the kind of things that you have when you have trapped ions on an ion trap, or when you have ultra cold atoms cooled down in a, in a, in a cavity interacting with one of the like modes of your, of your cavity. All right. So these two conditions are going to be the following. First, I'm going to assume that there is an optimal measurement that extracts the maximum information about my unknown quantity and that this can be performed. And this is going to, in principle, maybe allow me to saturate the quantum kramer rao bound of sensitivity. And the second condition is going to be that I'm, we are going to assume that the unknown quantity mu is encoded as the precession rate of these spins in the presence of an external magnetic field. And what that means is that the generator of the sensing evolution is one of the components of the collective angular momentum that you construct as the addition of the individual angular momentums of each of these particles. Now, with these two conditions set, then the problem again reduces only to a state preparation. And what are, we are going to look at is families of Hamiltonians that we are going to use to prepare our non-classical states and how long it will take for this evolution to reach a given target state. And we're gonna quantify the performance by looking at the metrological gain of the quantum Fisher information, a quantity defined by this ratio, where the denominator is the quantum Fisher information that you calculate as the variance of your generator. Now, when you think about this quantifier, there's usually two limits that 
people would like to compare the performance of their strategy with. One of them is the standard quantum limit given by metrological gain equals to unity. And this is saying that whatever strategy you have is not doing any better than what you could do with classical resources. So in a way, no quantum enhancement there. And the, in the other end, you have the Heisenberg limit, which is telling you that whatever strategy you have is performing as good as it is possible by, by what it is allowed by quantum mechanics. And oftentimes this limit is unreachable. And what people look for is to have a metrological gain that exhibits Heisenberg scaling. And by this, I mean, we have in denominators some cons positive constant that is guaranteed not to scale with the size of your system. Now, the goal will be then to have a strategy that generates a small values of this metrological game in the shortest time possible. Um, and the question is, how are we gonna do this? And this has been answered. And the answer is to use nonlinearity. So we are gonna focus on families of collective spin Hamiltonians that have terms which are nonlinear functions of the components of the collective angular momentum. And in order to analyze this, as the title of my talk suggested, what we're gonna do is to exploit um, the geometry of the phase space. So let me tell you a little bit more about collective spins and their associated uh, phase space. So again, a collective spin model is a description of this collection of atoms using a single collective degree of freedom. And the most general Hamiltonian based on these operators that you can write looks something like this. The important point here being that this Hamiltonian conserve the total angular momentum and what that means is that whatever phase space or representation you construct, quantum or classical, is guaranteed to have the time evolution constrained to the surface of a sphere. Now, as a side note, the type of product states that are going to be my initial state uh, are known as spinkronian states, which physically it can be understood as you have all of these spin one half particles in your collation that being polarized along the same direction. Now. The classical phase space representation is constructed by taking the thermodynamic limit of the Heisenberg equations of motion. And this gives you the state of your system being described by three classical numbers, uh, X, Y, and C, the components of the, of the mean angular momentum and the evolution given by a phase space flow. Now you can learn a lot about the structure of this phase space uh, flow by looking at the stationary points of this evolution and the stability given by the eigenvalues of the Jacobi matrix evaluated at the fixed point. Now, for Hamiltonian flows, as it is the case here, there are two, case, two deep types of stationary points. They can be either stable, which means the, the point is surrounded by periodic trajectories, or they can be saddles, which means you have two principal directions, one of which is being exponentially contracted, and the other one is being exponentially stretched. And in the situation when you, ha when you have an additional uh, saddle point in some other spatial location in phase space, you're going to see that these branches, uh, stable and unstable, connect different saddle points, and they are going to define separatrix lines. And the message here from the type of motion that points along these branches execute is that the separatrix is an exponential instability. And this will be very important for us in a couple of slides. So keep that in mind. Now, let me tell you how you can use these tools that I just described to analyze a particular nonlinear collective spin Hamiltonian that is known to be useful in quantum metrology schemes that is called or known as the two axis counter twisting. So it's given by two quadratic nonlinearities along perpendicular axis that I have chosen to be at along plus 45 and minus 45 degrees on the equatorial plane. And so now a state preparation looks like this simple evolution uh, that I have written here. I'm going to polarize all my spin one half particles pointing up in the C direction, evolve under my Hamiltonian up to some final preparation time and hopefully get a non-classical state. 
one might ask then what is a good notion of the best preparation time? And this of course depends on what is your target state. And something nice for us in this work is that it is known that this Hamiltonian allows for the rapid preparation of some metrological useful states whose names are here. The important um, message here being that they all exhibit Heisenberg scaling. So they give you very good metrological gains. And how, how long it takes for the evolution to reach each of these target states is a time that scales logarithmically with how many spins you have in your collection. And the last question I'm going to try to ask here today is going to be, what is the origin of this logarithmically short preparation time? And in a way, we have already seen or hinted at the answer, which is the branches of the separatrix going out or in into unstable points. And for this particular Hamiltonian, one can show something, some special properties which are local optimality, which whose geometric meaning is that the separatrix are branches are orthogonal, and global optimality, with the geometric meaning being that the separatrix branches define geodesics on the sphere. And one can go one step further and actually put this into a more formal footing, footing by making an, a mapping into uh, the time evolution saturate in a quantum speed limit then giving a better kind of like argument in favor of the optimality of this Hamiltonian. But I'm not going to give those details here. If you're inter interested, I'll encourage you to look into our work. Now, what we are going to do then to show that in fact, with this simple geometrical picture, you can have this logarithmically short preparation times is I'm going to place my spin coordinate state in the North pole of the sphere, it has some quantum projection noise that represented by some uncertainty patch. And I'm going to look at a single point at the border of this uncertainty patch. And I'm going to calculate how long it takes for this point to go from this initial position here all the way to this other position over here on the, on the right. And you can go and do the calculation and you find an expression like this, where now Given a target state, you can go and see what is this final coordinate that you need to plug into your expression. And I can, I can give you two examples here in red and blue. So in blue, we have the preparation time that it takes for this evolution to reach the optimal spin squeeze state. And in red, we have the time that it takes for this evolution to reach the non-classical state that minimizes the value of the metrological gain of the quantum Fisher information. And notice that they are both logarithmically shorter times in the size of the system. So in fact, we have by direct computation verified that it is the exponential instability of the separatrix and the geometry of this, uh, of this curve, the responsible for these short preparation times. However, one might have here uh, a complaint, right? Because in a way, these expressions were computed by complete classical means. There were no quantum calculations involved. And you might ask, well, these are formally correct in the limit of having a collection of spins that have infinitely many spins, but this is never the case in any finite size experiment. So are they still good when you consider your system far away from the infinitely large case? And the answer is yes, you can go and do full calculations of these two meteorological gains, calculate what is the time of these peaks, and compare that with the value that you get from this expression. That is what is shown here on the right-hand side plot. And we see that even for systems as small as 10, which is very far from the thermodynamic limit, these expressions that were computed by completely classical means are still giving you the correct preparation times for these non-classical states. And with this, I'm just going to summarize. Um, the main message that I would like to communicate here is that thinking about the phase space geometry allows you to, to map a problem in the time evolution of quantum states 
into a problem that is only concerns with the geometry of curves on the surface of a sphere. And this is a very powerful tool that you can in principle use to make claims of optimality or suboptimality of any collective spin Hamiltonian. And we also laid out some interesting connections to the phenomenology of quantum phase transitions. Um, again, if you're interested, feel free to, to, to look at the, at the preprint, or if you want to have more of a discussion, I'll be happy to talk to you, send me an email. Uh, I will, again, thank you for the invitation. I will take any questions. Are there any questions from anybody? This is Terrell again. Uh, thank you, Manuel. Um, I've got a few terms I need to look up. I never really, um, I, I've been interested in metrology for a while as part of the quantum studying I'm doing uh, and haven't really thought about the state preparation. Um, I'm not prepared to ask a question, but I'll make a comment. It was something I learned a few weeks ago, the, uh, the importance of calibrating your measurements um, can't be under undersold in that, um, you know, the United States Air Force has this stealth bomber, the B-2 bomber. And I guess it's been around maybe a decade or two that it's been in existence. And the only crash that ever occurred was the, uh, in that, in that uh, plane, was the five sensors that are used to determine the height of the plane or the, you know, the, I forget the term for it, but distance off the ground. And the reason that plane crashed is the uh, initial state of two of those sensors were incorrectly calibrated before the plane took off because there was a little moisture in the sensor. So the, the sensors themselves were, were uh, calibrated, but incorrectly. In other words, their initial state was wrong. And that actually caused the only crash that that plane's ever experienced. So, uh, you know, that's a tangible uh, story, true one about, uh, you know, the importance of, uh, of state, getting the state prepared right, uh, as you say. Um, I don't know I think, how much that has to do with what you're saying, for yeah, sure, no, but, but uh, no, it is an important point. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I actually, like, thank you very much for the comment, because it, it brings up a, a very important question and a very timely question, especially given the this, what people like to call the noisy intermediate scale quantum devices era that we are currently in, right? So when I, when I say in my talk that, oh, okay, so I, I wanted to do, I wanna leave in theory land and only focus on the first part, on the first stage of this, kind of like abstract description of what a quantum metrology protocol looks. Uh, I'm, I'm making assumptions about how well I can do the other two. And the big assumption is I can do them perfectly. And that of course fails for the current devices that we have. In particular, for the measurements, I'm saying on one hand, I know what the optimal measurement is, which means I know what is that I need to measure to extract the maximum allowed information per measurement. And I know that I can perform it. And those two are gigantic ifs. And again, one could also make another talk only focusing on the third part and saying that usually the and very, very generally speaking, the optimal measurement is either no known, or if it is known, is really hard to implement. So there is another whole area of quantum metrology that is devoted to, okay, I don't have access to the quantum, to the optimal measurement. I can measure something else. How can I maximize the sensitivity of my scheme given the measurement that I can actually perform? Um, and that is indeed a very timely um, research subject, especially given the type of, of devices to which we have access right now. So just, thank you very much for the comment. Just to check my vocabulary, how does that, is that Fisher information that you're talking, you mentioned it 
Uh, one of you mentioned it. Is it is yes. that Fisher information? Quantum yes. Fisher? Yeah, yes. Okay. Got it. Thank I you. I think Tyler has a question. Uh, uh, hi, Manuel. I really enjoyed the talk. Thank I you. It's nice curious. to see you, Tyler. Yeah, it's good to see you too. Uh, I uh, am is curious if there is any connection with the between your work and this recent paper um, that just came out. This improving quantum metrology with scrambling paper. I don't know if you've seen this. Uh, if you haven't, uh, just put it in the chat. I don't know. It might be, but you might just have seen it. I don't know. Not no big deal. I'm curious. You just have to pop your head really um, closely related, or I'm I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, the The only or... thing the only thing that comes to my head, like right now, is that well, again, a scrambling can be described as a unitary process, right? That takes something, takes an initial state that you could call quote unquote a sort of classical state or a product state and maps that into a highly non-classical state. So in that sense, I will say that you could, right? Like, like whatever you put here during the state preparation, I don't see why it couldn't be a quantum evolution that gives you a scrambling. Um, and maybe that non-classical state, I mean, not maybe, Given that there is a paper about it, I assume that the non-classical state that results of that is metrologically useful. Cool. Yeah, thanks. I, yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so this gives us, a, first of all, an opportunity to thank Manuel once again. And we are now going to transition to the last uh, presenter. Before I do that, for the sake of the recording, I want to mention here a question from Manuel for our industry partners. And the question goes like this, could you list the top three skills that you value the most when you hire a theorist for your quantum team? So this for Tero, this would be a really good question to ask and collect information from all the members um, and then share with, um, with, 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 um, with students. Yeah, but, that is a that would be an interesting discussion question, no doubt. Mm -hmm. There was a similar question from Carolyn that was, um, I would like to ask them whether any of these points resonate with them, you know, the points in her presentation, and to what degree do they consider societal acceptability in their work? That's another important thing that I think it would be good to know. So with this, um, uh, once again, thank you, Manuel. I'm gonna share the screen uh, for the sake of showing the, I guess the title. The last presentation is by Tyler G. Tartel. The presentation title is Optimizing One Axis Twists for Realistic Variational Bayesian Quantum Metrology. And while I'm introducing him, I'm going to stop the sh uh, sharing the screen so he can share the screen. Tyler is a graduate student at the Center for Quantum Information and Control at the University of New Mexico, working with Dr. Akimasa Miyake, um, that group. His research focuses on quantum sensing and NISC algorithms with influence from quantum many body physics. Please go ahead, Tyler. Okay. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, so, I'm going to tell you all today about a project I recently completed with my advisor, Dr. Akimasa Miyake, about variational quantum metrology. Um, we have a preprint on the archive, the number is down here, and if you're interested, I will also have the number on the last slide. Uh, so uh, the setting we're considering is that of quantum sensing or quantum metrology, so the setup will be similar to what Manuel has uh, just showed us. Our general goal is that we'd like to estimate some parameter phi of a quantum channel as uh, precisely and accurately as we can. The way we're going to think about doing that in this talk is beginning with the all-plus state, and then we're going to send the all plus state through some noisy quantum channel, which we'll think of as an encoding. That will result in us having some probe state. Following that, we'll send this probe state through some free evolution channel, which depends on this value phi we want to estimate, which will then make state depend on the value phi. Following that, we'll send the state through some decoding, which will again be a potentially noisy quantum circuit. 
And following this decoding, we'll always have an end with a global rotation about the x-axis by pi over two, followed by what you can think of as a computational basis measurement. We'll then post-process all of the, the output of that measurement into an estimate of this value phi, such that when averaged over measurement outcomes, uh, the estimator is proportional to the sum of the expectation value of all these Z units. Uh, one of the things that will be very important throughout this entire talk is that we'll consider this channel we're trying to estimate is just a rotation uh, about the Z axis by some angle phi, uh, plus possibly some noise channel. So I want to say that there's two uh, paradigms that people generally think of in sensing. And the first one is the entanglement free paradigm. So I have a whole bunch of probes here, and I send them through the channel to be measured all independently. And the second is the so called entanglement enhanced sensing. And in this setting, I will first allow my probes to interact in some way, bring them apart, and then send them through the channel, let them interact again, and then finally they'll be measured. And the idea is that during these interaction periods, they can become entangled with one another. And this can allow our sensing to be more precise and more accurate. Um, but we don't just wanna think about what sensing we can do uh, in principle. We wanna think what we can do with some particular set of resources that could be realized in some particular device that hopefully is available now or in the near future. So that kind of restricts and makes the problem more complicated. We also want to worry about the effects of noise, which might even be device specific. And we also want to tailor our uh, strategies for sensing to any prior knowledge we might have about this angle that we're trying to estimate. Um, one paradigm for addressing all of these complications that's emerged recently is that of variational methods. Um, so you can look in these, for example, these four papers I have in the lower left, if you want some um, you know, introduction, these are sort of the early works of these for this type. Uh, but the idea here is that we're going to replace our encoding and decoding uh, procedures with parameterized circuits. So our parameterized circuit is a quantum circuit in which the gates depend on some classical number that uh, we want to then optimize, possibly with feedback from the actual device to uh, make our sensing strategy as good as possible. And while this is a promising procedure or promising avenue, um, it's very new, and so a lot of work is still needed in terms of analyzing which parameterized circuits we should use and understanding how effective they are and how robust they are to noise. So that's where we come in. In this paper, we introduce a new family of parameterized circuits for this problem and theoretically analyze their effectiveness and their robustness to noise. So the pieces that we're going to build our parameterized circuits out of are global rotations and one-axis twists. So um, both of these are defined in terms of total angular momentum components. And so total angular momentum component is just one half the sum over the poly operators in some direction over summed up over every single. And then a global rotation is just generated by a single total angular momentum component. And a one axis twist is generated by the square of a total angular momentum component. I want to note here that all of uh, our entangling resources come from the one axis twist, which generate sort of a global icing like interaction. And I also want to note that there's a permutation symmetry in this, uh, in all of these operations. This permutation symmetry is important because it uh, simplifies our simulations because we can restrict to the n plus one dimensional symmetric subspace. I also mention it because we're going to break the permutation symmetry later, but for now we have it and it's helpful. Uh, so we call the family of parameterized circuits we introduce arbitrary axis twist circuits. They're illustrated in the bottom left here. You can see that it's sort of a one axis twist and two uh, rotations. And then we kind of repeat this pattern. Uh, we abbreviate these by AAT MN when we use for the member of this family that uses M encoding twists and N decoding twists. Uh, and generally speaking, you can think that what these implements are effectively uh, an alternation of one axis twists about arbitrary directions and rotations in arbitrary directions. I want to compare this approach to a family of parameterized circuits that were considered previously for this problem in three papers that are down in the bottom left corner here that were very uh, inspiring and motivational for us in uh, pursuing this line of reasoning. Uh, and so we refer to these as parity symmetric circuits and abbreviate them par MN. They're illustrated here, and you can kind of see that instead of one twist and two rotations, they consider two twists and one rotation. 
The general idea and the reason we call these parity symmetric circuit layers is that the generator of each gate is required to commute with the product of poly X on every single qubit, or the X parity operator. And the reason this is a positive thing to do is that it guarantees that when you average your estimator at the end of the procedure over, uh, over measurement outcomes, it will be anti-symmetric about the angle you're trying to estimate. Uh, and this is, uh, well, this is positive because we would like these estimators to look as much like lines as possible because they're just trying to, as a function of the angle, because they're just trying to give us the exact value of the angle. Uh, when we compare the uh, number, sort of the number of one axis twist per parameter here, we see that if we look at bar 2M2N, it has about half as many parameters as AAT 2M2N. And so this is sort of a trade-off between the power of increased entanglement and the power of increased freedom of rotation direction. Okay, so I've told you we want to optimize our parameterized circuits. There's one more piece that I need to tell you about if we really want to set up an optimization problem, and that's a figure of merit or an objective. Uh, to set this up, we take a Bayesian statistics approach to the problem, which is to say we treat phi, this angle, as a... Uh, as a random variable and introduce a prior distribution for it, denoted by p sub phi. We always take this to be a Gaussian distribution with mean zero and standard deviation delta phi. And then we define the Bayesian mean squared error to be, uh, to be this big delta phi squared, which is given by this formula. And if you look, it's essentially the uh, mean squared error at a given value of phi averaged over our prior distribution. <laughs> And then the figure of merit we take is the ratio of big delta phi to little delta phi, which quantifies our essentially our uncertainty after uh, our uncertainty after the measurement relative to our uncertainty before the measurement. Okay. Oh, there we go. So the first thing we did then is uh, numerically optimize our arbitrary axis twist on sotsis in the absence of noise and for just a few one-axis twists. And so the results are shown in this figure here. On the x-axis, I'm plotting, so we have the standard deviation of the prior distribution. And the y-axis is the our figure of merit. So the things to notice here are the blue curve, blue circles uh, demonstrate what's possible without entanglement. The downward facing pink triangles show what's optimally allowed by quantum mechanics. And in between, we see that the first big improvement is given by these green triangles, which uh, occur when we add a single uh, encoding twist. And then the next big improvement is these red diamonds, which happens when we add a single decoding twist on top of the encoding twist. And then the next big improvement comes from the brown crosses, which occurs when we add an additional decoding twist. So this is AAT12. This indicates to us that once there's a single encoding and decoding twist in use, you're better off to add your entangling resources to the decoding, at least the one axis. So next we look at the effect of increasing the number of uh, twists used in the decoding. Uh, so here we go up to five decoding twists. And while we do see improvement with the number of twists, uh, we also observe that there is diminishing return, indicating that at least in some settings, you may not want to strive for the absolute optimal performance. You may be better off uh, limiting the number of one axis twists you're using and just getting uh, the improved performance that you can. And I also want to note that these types of observations line up well with things that were previously observed in the context of the parity symmetric circuits. Uh, so next we compare more directly with the performance of the parity symmetric circuits. And so we see that in the two twist regime, uh, our arbitrary axis twist circuits can lead to some improvement. For example, our AAT11 seems to outperform uh, the PAR22 setup, and the AAT14 uh, setup seems to perform comparably to the PAR26 setup. The next thing we did was uh, account, uh, add, try to study the effect of uh, noise in the free evolution stage. In particular, we wanted to study the effect of spatially correlated noise. But as I mentioned earlier, the spatially correlated noise is a problem for us because it breaks the permutation symmetry that we were using to facilitate our simulations. Our solution to this problem came from matrix product states and operators. Um, I think in the interest of time, I probably shouldn't go into too much detail about this, uh, but 
just to give you a very rough idea, we try to simulate things for as long as possible using symmetric subspace techniques or techniques closely related to symmetric subspace techniques, and then only map things to matrix product states when we absolutely have to at the very end. And the effect is that uh, as long as the noise model has an efficient matrix product representation, the entire process can be simulated uh, in polynomial cost. Uh, okay. So the spatially correlated noise that we actually ended up considering is this is a correlated dephasing channel. Mm -hmm. So now during the free evolution, rather than every spin being rotated by the same angle phi, each spin is rotated by phi plus some random amount that is different at each site. These uh, random R sub J's are taken to be Gaussian random variables with mean zero and covariance is given by this equation. So in particular, C1 is the variance at each site of these R sub J's, and C2 is the covariance between adjacent neighboring sites. And then we took our arbitrary axis twist, for example, 1-1 one, one, uh, strategy that was, we take the, using the circuit parameters that are found to be optimal in the absence of noise, and study the robustness of that strategy to this noise. So in particular, on the x-axis here, I'm showing the covariance between adjacent sites, and the y-axis is the variance of a single site, and the heat map is showing the, uh, the R figure of merit. And then, of course, oh, well, I should say these black curves indicate regions, lines of constant values of R figure of merit. So our observations from this are that uh, the correlated noise is not, is not significantly worse than the uncorrelated noise in terms of loss of performance. And in fact, we observe improved performance in the presence of anti-correlated noise. Uh, our explanation for the origin of this uh, improvement for the anti-correlated noise is that uh, at the end of the day, we to some extent have a separate estimator for each spin, and our total estimator is the average of the estimators for all spins. So if our error on this spin and this spin are sort of anti-correlated, we expect that there could be some cancellation of the errors. Next, we study the robustness of these strategies, the circuit level noise. In particular, we consider the effect of gate dephasing on single qubit gate de single qubit dephasing after each one axis twist on each qubit. So again, we take the strategies we found to be optimal in the absence of noise and see how robust they are to this type. And so on the x-axis, I'm plotting the probability of a dephasing error on a, in a single one of these dephasing channels. And on the y-axis, I'm plotting our figure of merit. And the key observations from this plot are that the which strategy performs best actually depends on the noise strength. And in fact, by the time we get down to P is 10 to the minus two, we see that actually the AAT12 strategy is the best one outperforming all of the uh, ones with deeper decoding circuits. Uh, and we also see that, well, another way of thinking about this is that this enhances the uh, diminishing returns with depth that we previously observed. Uh, and so with that, I will stop and see if there are any questions and say thank you. Thank you. If there are any questions, this would be the time to ask them. Well, I have a comment. This is Terrell. Just thank you, Tyler. You gave me a lot to chew on there. I had trouble following a lot of it. It's out of my, out of my wheelhouse, but uh, I'll take a look at the slides and think about them later. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, I have a question. So, Tyler, uh, you mentioned that uh -huh. uh, having deeper encoding and decoding eventually uh, ends up being like stops giving you advantage. Uh, yes. And uh, why is that? Like intuit intuitively, uh, I would have assumed that if it is longer, like you you keep doing better, right? Right, and um, and we do observe that you do continue to see improvement. It's just that the amount of improvement you get for each additional twist seems to be smaller. I mean, so for example, the, uh, the amount of improvement between when we use one twist, so this red curve, and when we use three twists, so the orange curve, versus when we use five, which is the blue stars on this plot, is much smaller, right? Um, and I don't know, we're not exactly sure why. I mean, 
to some extent, it may just be that you are approaching the optimal and you have to sort of target very particular strategies to really get down to this optimal curve. And those are just hard to hard to exactly find when you're doing this optimization or when you're limited in the resources you can use. Um, it's a good question, but we're not exactly sure. And if, if you don't mind me asking another question. Sure. So the other question is, I mean, I, mean, I, I think it's, it's very interesting that the most improvement, like, like point number one here, right? Uh, so does this mean that the most important part is the measurement and the state preparation is not really that important? No, I don't think I would say that. Um, I I think it could have something to. So we tried to choose resources here that are, you know, resources people consider in using, um, in the experiments. And uh, I I don't think it's necessarily that. I think it's potentially more that the these resources are very good at the encoding, um, in the sense that it's been previously observed that in this. Uh, set up where you're trying to essentially optimize the Spazian mean squared error, that good probe states, spin squeeze states are good probe states. And one axis twisting is good at making spin squeeze states. And so in that sense, I think it's not too surprising that um, that you don't need as many of these resources in the encoding. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, well, any, any other questions? So if there are no other questions, I am going to say thank you so much to AJ, Carolyn, Manuel, and Tyler for coming here today. Uh, I think we're gonna have this recording uh, process available tomorrow when I'll post it, I'll email you and let you know. And for everybody who is watching us in this recording, Join us next time, March 21st, when we have our next session. Thanks again, and have a wonderful rest of Tuesday. Thank you all, and thank you, Adrian, too. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks.